Okay, uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Aziz. I'm one of the C1s in the uh, UFT cardiology program, and I'll be presenting hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, and echo review. Um, David Dorian presented uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in Ground Grounds this week. We didn't really coordinate the two talks, but it will complement the other talk, uh, focusing more on the echo part of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, so the objectives of the talk today uh, will be able to identify the different patterns and key features of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, understand the utility of echocardiography in the diagnosis and prognosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and review how uh, transesophageal echo can assist in both septal myectomy and alcohol septal ablations, and then we'll look at a brief review on some of the mimickers of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, so first, the definition of uh, HCM. So this is from the 2020 AHA ACC guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of HCM. Uh, defined as a disease characterized by predom uh, predominantly by LVH in the absence of another cardiac, systemic, or metabolic disease capable of producing the magnitude of uh, hypertrophy. Uh, so kind of an introduction. Um, Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common genetic cardiomyopathy with a prevalence of about one in 500. And in some uh, parts of the literature, it says one in every 200 adults worldwide. Uh, this is across all ethnicities and all geographic areas. Uh, the genes responsible are uh, inherited at autosomal dominant. Uh, there's a little, uh, it's a disease that involves the sarcomeres of the myocardium. Um, there have been over 1,400 mutations identified across uh, uh, 13 different genes. And I can, depending on where you look in the literature, some, um, some say more than 2,000 mutations. Um, despite this, it's, it's a benign disease in most adults. A lot of people don't even know they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and have normal lifespans. But as you all know, uh, the disease can have uh, serious adverse events. So it's important to... Uh, diagnose it and also screen first degree relatives once we make a diagnosis in a, in a patient. So just looking at the histo histological level, uh, on the left you see the normal myocardium, you have the myocytes uh, organized in a linear fashion next to each other, which helps with the overall function of the left ventricle. Uh, while in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you have this myocardial disarray, this disorganization of the myocardium. Um, I was going over this with Dr. Chow yesterday, and he mentioned it does look like a uh, starry night from Van Gogh. And if you put them next to each other, they actually do look uh, pretty similar. Uh, so like, like we were discussing, since uh, HCM is mostly benign, a lot of people are asymptomatic. It's an under-recognized condition. Uh, the literature estimates we might be diagnosing only 10% of uh, patients with uh, HCM in the community. And of those 10%, 6% are symptomatic, 4% are asymptomatic. That's picked up incidentally on an echo or uh, MRI CT. Um, the diagnosis, there's no real pathic mnemonic feat, echo features that if you see, you can straight away make the diagnosis of HCM. It's more a clinical diagnosis. So you have to take all the data points uh, clinically and imaging together to make the diagnosis. But some features on echo that could suggest hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a wall thickness that's greater than 15 millimeters uh, or more than 13 if there's a family of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, although most cases are average around 20 millimeters, it will have by the time they're diagnosed. Uh, and then you uh, want to see an abscess of typical pressure load conditions, uh, such as hypertension or aortic stenosis, that can explain the hypertrophy. Now, these conditions can coexist, but uh, if you don't have a stenosis or hypertension, that kind of argues for hypercardiomyopathy. And finally, uh, typically asymmetric, but uh, rarely can be concentric at times. Uh, in terms of the clinical presentation, as we discussed before, most patients are asymptomatic, but some of the clinical features can occur. Uh, so exertion, uh, chest pain, and that's usually due to supply demand mismatch. You, you have an increased demand for oxygen in the heart, due to the yeah, hyper yeah. muscles, uh, uh, increase O2 demand. And then um, if you're going to get some fibrosis in the coronary arterioles, which decreases the supply, which all contribute to this uh, episode yeah. of uh, ischemic chest pain. Uh, 
Um, they can have free sync of your related to exertion. This could be uh, either from arrhythmias versus uh, LVO2 obstruction, uh, palpitations, and uh, sudden cardiac death. Which, which unfortunately, in some individuals, can be the presenting system, uh, symptom of the. So uh, this is from uh, ASC guidelines on uh, what we should keep an eye out for while doing an uh, echo of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So first we want to screen for any uh, presence of hypertrophy. Uh, pretty much all the walls should be assessed. As we mentioned, it can be asymmetric. Uh, so we look at septal, posterior, anterior walls, kind of everything, and document the uh, maximal thickness. We want to assess the left uh, ventricular contraction in these patients. Mostly, uh, preserved, but uh, decreased ejection fraction is a uh, one of the markers of a bad, a bad prognosis. Uh, we also want to assess the right ventricle for hypertrophy and there's RV dynamic obstruction, uh, LA volume index to body surface area, uh, the LV diastolic dysfunction as uh, um, there's usually diastolic dysfunction with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, pulmonary systolic pressure. Uh, dynamic obstruction at rest, which I'll explain in uh, um, a couple of slides. Uh, the mitral valve and capillary muscles should be evaluated. And finally, for patients who are not responding to medical therapy, we can consider TEE to guide surgical and alcohol septal ablations. And finally, screening. Once we have a diagnosis of HCM uh, confirmed uh, in a patient, we want to screen all first degree. So uh, the different patterns of uh, HCM, this is based on a cohort of 382 patients. I believe the study was done in the 90s. Uh, the most common type is the uh, sigmoid, uh, where you can see the uh, hypertrophy in the basal septum, uh, uh, quoted around 47% of patients. Uh, then you have the re re reverse curve, which is the, uh, oh, sorry. Reverse curve, second picture. Uh, you have the neutral where you can have like concentric hypertrophy and not all the myocardium. Again, that's uh, less common, only in 8% of patients. And then finally, apical uh, uh, HCM, uh, which can be difficult to identify. Uh, that's why when apical HCM is suspected, uh, the addition of an echo contrast is usually recommended to better uh, characterize it. So I uh, just have some examples here of the asymmetric septal hypertrophy. You can see the uh, you see my mouse? So uh, you can see the hypertrophy yes. there in the septum. You compare it to the uh, the interior wall there, it's uh, uh, asymmetrical. Uh, just the same image on a uh, short axis and a four chamber as well. Okay. And this is apical hypertrophy. This is one of the more obvious uh, cases. You can clearly see the apex is hypertrophied. And if you add the contrast, uh, sometimes there you can have obstruction at the level of the apex, which um, kind of traps this contrast there in the apex and gives you this, uh, what we call a spade sign. So as we mentioned, LVAF is very important. It is mostly preserved in uh, uh, patients with HCM. Uh, however, the end diastolic volumes and the stroke volume can be reduced because the hypertrophy is often at the expense of the uh, LV cavity size. So they have reduced uh, cavity sizes. Um, and finally, if you have an LVF that's less than 50%, we call this end stage HCM or burnt out HCM, it occurs in about 2 to 5% of patients and is a bad prognostic sign. Uh, diastolic function should also be assessed. It's frequently uh, affected due to non-uniform uh, ventricular contraction and relaxation. There's an uh, impairment in intracellular calcium uptake, which leads to uh, delayed inactivation. And finally, the severe hypertrophy and myocardial ischemia lead to chamber stiffness, all contributing to diastolic dysfunction. Uh, mitral valve abnormalities are quite common. Uh, the leaflets uh, themselves are involved in about 50% uh, of patients. Uh, you can see the normal mitral valve on the left. The most common abnormality is you get an interior, elong uh, anterior leaflet elongation. Uh, you can have posterior elongation or bileaflet elongation as well. 
the papillary muscles can also be involved. Uh, again, you see the normal picture on the left. Uh, there, you, the abnormalities are present usually in tw about 25% of patients, uh, the most commonly being an anterior displacement and hypertrophy of the papillary muscles. Uh, you can have direct insertion of the papillary muscle to the uh, uh, ventricular side of the leaflets with no cords, like in the third picture, or you can have uh, uh, abnormal a cord that leads to tenting, which contributes to LVOT obstruction and uh, systolic anterior motion. So what is systolic anterior motion? So these changes in the mitral valve that we just discussed uh, predispose it to the drag forces created by the uh, hyperdynamic uh, ejection fraction, uh, leading to basically suction of that uh, anterior leaflet into the LVOT, causing uh, obstruction uh, or turbulent blood flow. Uh, now, the uh, SAM can involve either the leaflet or the cord, but L uh, LVOT obstruction is usually from valve uh, SAM. Sorry, leaflet SAM. Um, again, it is an important feature to identify, but is not required to make the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you can have HCM without uh, SAM. Now, what are the forces contributing to SAM? So what most people believe, and what I believed before preparing for the SOC, is what it, it was mostly the Venturi effect, which is basically you have a high velocity going through the uh, LVOT, which causes a lower pressure and basically uh, um, kind of pulls the uh, um, anterior mitral valve leaflet into the uh, LVOT, causing the obstruction. Uh, the other force is the drag effect, which actually is the predominant force. Uh, this was uh, exhibited by uh, doing echoes and then measuring the velocity in the LVOT as soon as SAM started, the velocities are actually low, which kind of signifies that the drag effect is the actually predominant force and the venturi effect is kind of a, a helping force in causing uh, this uh, uh, systolic anterior motion. So here we have an M mode, where you can clearly see uh, the mitral valve leaf fit going into the LVOT and causing uh, the obstruction. Um, because of this uh, pulling force on the anterior leaflet, it causes a disruption in the uh, mitral valve coaptation, which leads to MR. It's usually a posteriorly directed jet since the anterior leaflet is the one being affected. Um, similar to LVOT gradients, MR is a dynamic uh, uh, change in HCM. Uh, I'll talk about the different factors that affect the uh, LVOT gradients and MR in uh, the next couple of slides. And then an important thing to keep in mind is not all mitral regurgitation is related to uh, HCM. So if we see a central or anterior directed jet, it should prompt careful evaluation of the mitral valve to look for any, uh, other causes that could be contributing to the regurgitation. Um, here on the left, you see the mitral valve leaflet uh, going into the LVOT, causing the obstruction. A, and on the right with the color Doppler, you see the high velocities in the LVOT and the uh, mitral regurgitation going back into the left atrium. So LVOT obstruction, like we mentioned, is dynamic. It's due to the combination of the septal hypertrophy, the abnormal blood flow vectors, and the systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. Uh, it's defined by a LVO2 gradient of more than 30 millimeters mercury, and it's present about in 70% of patients. Not all patients with HCM will have LVOT obstruction. In those 70%, uh, about 37% uh, will have obstruction even during rest, and 33% will, will only see the uh, LVOT obstruction with uh, provocable uh, maneuvers such as valve alva or uh, squatting to standing. Uh, or exercise. And that's why it's important to do these uh, uh, maneuvers to make sure we diagnose these obstruction if present, as it could explain the patient's symptoms. So how do we measure it? We use a continuous wave Doppler to get the maximum velocity and a pulsive wave Doppler to measure the velocities at different sites. <clears throat> it is best done at the apical five chamber view, but could also be done on the three chamber view to see if we can get uh, higher gradients there. Important note about the pulse wave Doppler, we, you should walk it from the apex up to the LVOT obstruction, because you can have, uh, uh, sorry, at, to the level of the LVOT, because you could have uh, obstruction at different sites. You can have apical obstruction, mid-cavity obstruction, or obstruction at the LVOT. Uh, 
And an important note is to make sure we're not com uh, contaminating the LVOT signal with the MR jet since they're right next to each other. So we have to make sure that we're actually measuring the LVOT gradient and not the uh, mitral regurgitation. And then uh, it is important to rule out a fixed obstruction. So make sure this gradient is related to HCM and not aortic stenosis or a valvular membrane. So it's very important to uh, uh, view the aortic valve and make an evaluation there. So just to explain the uh, different uh, Dopplers of the uh, LVOT obstruction versus uh, mitral regurgitation. As you can see in the pictures, they're right next to each other. So on the right, we have the uh, uh, the uh, Doppler for the uh, mitral regurgitation. As you can see with the QRS, it starts in the beginning of systole. It has a more parabolic or bell-shaped profile, uh, which kind of gives us a clue that this is uh, mitral regurgitation, not uh, the LVOT gradient. For the LVOT gradient on the left, it starts during mid systole. It is dynamic, so the velocities get higher as there's more obstruction going into systole. And that gives us this characteristic dagger style uh, shape. Uh, you can see here it's kind of a diagram of both uh, jets uh, superimposed on each other. You can see the LVOT jet in the uh, light gray and the MR jet in the darker gray. Uh, also, an important finding. Uh, this is the uh, Doppler of aortic stenosis. As you can see, it's not dagger shaped either. It's a nice parabolic uh, profile as well. So uh, we talked about that LVOT and MR are dynamic. So what are the factors that uh, can lead to this variation by up to 30 millimeters of mercury per day? So it depends on the following. First is you, you basically your preload, your contractility, your afterload. So preload, uh, if you do Valsalva or Scott stand, that drops your preload, you get more obstruction. Anemia, dehydration, diuretic could all lead to decreased preload as well and more obstruction. LV contractility, so that's mainly affected by medications. Uh, so if the patients in CCU on dobutamine or milrinone, they'll cause increased contractility and increased obstruction. Beta blockers or calcium channel blockers can decrease the contractility and improve the obstruction. Uh, this is one of the factors why if we have a patient in shock from, which we believe it's from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's best to avoid uh, inotropic uh, agents and try to focus more on uh, uh, vasopressors and increasing afterload. And finally, afterload. So increased afterload is good for the uh, obstruction. If you have decreased afterload, that will worsen your LVOT obstructions. And then it's important to keep in mind that LVOT obstruction does have a differential. It's not all related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So some of the differential includes uh, septal bulge of the elderly, uh, takotsubu, uh, since you have a hyperdynamic base, or um, uh, uh, status post MVR with annuloplasty. And as we mentioned before, you can have mid-ventricular obstruction or obstruction at the level of the apex, not necessarily just the LVOT. Uh, finally, if we have um, difficulty obtaining windows on uh, echocardiography, uh, cardiac MRI is a great uh, test to evaluate for HCM. You can see the septal hypertrophy in the, for, in the uh, first uh, picture on the right. And then you can also evaluate for uh, uh, fibrosis, which is an early sign seen in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, seen on the second and third uh, pictures on the right uh, with the arrows. So uh, just kind of a brief on the medical therapy. So uh, we kind of uh, focus on the factors that affect the uh, VO2 gradient. So for preload optimization, we avoid dehydration, cautious use of diuretics for symptomatic patients. Uh, we use beta blockers or uh, nine dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers to slow the heart rate, increasing the fill-in time and therefore increasing preload. We try to reduce contractility by beta blockers, nine dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, uh, we avoid the, avoid the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers as they can uh, decrease your afterload. And then finally, disoperamide, which is an antiarrhythmic drug that uh, was found to uh, decrease, uh, have a negative inotropic effect. And then finally, we avoid afterload uh, reduction. So for patients that are uh, refractory to medical therapy, uh, we can either uh, refer them for a septal myectomy, which is a surgical procedure, or an alcohol septal ablation. And a TEE is an important factor to help guide, guide both procedures. Uh, 
So I'll talk about septal myectomies first. It basically, they've been successfully performed since the 1960s. Uh, for, it involves a sternotomy, uh, cut down. Uh, they go through the aorta and cut uh, out the uh, removing portions of the septum that's causing the obstruction. So TE plays a key role in help guiding surgical uh, myectomy. It contributes to surgical planning. Uh, it also, after the repair, it determines the adequacy of the repair if they should cut off uh, more of the septum and uh, detects any complications that could arise from this procedure. Um, it, TE is also important as it can evaluate the mitral valve for any of, of the abnormalities we mentioned. And uh, if needed, they can either repair or replace the valve during the same procedure. So this is a, you can see they can cut off quite a bit of myocardium during these procedures. Uh, it's myocardium there. And here's an echo post uh, my, so pre myectomy on the left, you can see the thickened septum. And then uh, post myectomy, you can see a significant uh, uh, change in the thickness of the uh, septum. So, some of the complications. So, short term is complete heart block, which is rare, but about 50% do develop left bundle branch block. Uh, VSD from injury to the septum. You can have cardiac tamponade. Uh, aortic regurgitation if you uh, damage the aortic valve in any way, and the routine surgical complications such as bleeding, infection, and wound healing. Uh, long term, you you can have a coronary camerular fistula, which is basically a communication between the coronary arteries and a cardiac chamber. Uh, the advantage, though, for um, septal myectomy versus alcohol septal ablation is you have uh, uh, a lower chance of needing a repeat procedure with septal myectomies. So the second procedure is alcohol septal ablation. So basically they go in through the groin to the aorta, down the left main, left anterior descending artery into the septal uh, branches. Uh, what, when they get there, they inject alcohol to basically cause a localized infarction, which leads to atrophy of the myocardium and improvement in the LVOT gradient. So previously this was done without the assistance of echo, uh, had higher complications and higher use of uh, ethanol, uh, and then they decided, uh, why don't we use TEE to help guide us in which branch we need to inject the uh, alcohol in. So basically, they uh, go into the branch they want, they inject a uh, echo contrast, and you can see opacification of the left side of the septum on the left and opacification of the right side on the right. That helps tell them like exactly which part of the septum this branch uh, um, supplies. So they can have a more accurate assessment in which branch to inject the ethanol in. Uh, the advantages of using this contrast is you get a shorter intervention time, shorter fluoroscopy time, uh, fewer occluded vessels, a uh, smaller amount of ethanol used, a smaller infarct size, a uh, lower likelihood of heart block, and a higher likelihood of success of the procedure. Uh, you can see pre and post ablation here. So on the left, uh, in the second row, you see the you have significant MR, high velocities in the LVOT. Post alcohol ablation, the velocities are down and the MR is only mild now. So complications of this procedure, again, you have a risk of complete heart block, which is rare, but 50% develop right bundle branch block instead of left bundle seen with septal myectomies. Uh, VSDs again, tamponade. Uh, VFib, VTAC is quoted in the literature uh, literature, uh, the potential risk, the thinking there being that you are causing an infarction in the septum and uh, the, the fear of uh, causing anitis for having ventricular ectopy and uh, arrhythmias. However, uh, like following these patients long term, they found they actually do not have a higher incidence of VFib and VTAC. Uh, coronary dissection, since we're in the coronary arteries with our wires, uh, doing a bunch of interventions, papillary muscle rupture, secondary to the infarction. Uh, extravasation of the alcohol, which is one of the catastrophic uh, complications of the procedure. The downsides to alcohol ablation is you have a you can have residual high gradients, and then you you can have a need for repeat procedures in the future. So we kind of take in uh, different factors to decide what's more appropriate for our patients. So some of the factors that uh, favor a septal myectomy is a uh, septal thickness. Uh, greater than 30 millimeters, uh, LVOT gradients higher than 100 millimeters mercury, 
uh, need for concomitant surgical procedures. So if you're going in to fix a mitral valve as well, or if the patient has significant coronary disease needing a bypass, so you can do multiple things in one surgery. And finally, if the coronary anatomy is not suitable for an alcohol ablation. Uh, factors that favor an alcohol septal ablation is if you have only mild to moderate septal hypertrophy, less than 1.8 centimeters. If uh, the patient's not suitable for open heart surgery given their comorbidities or advanced age. And finally, if you only have localized turbulence in the MJOT and not obstruction. Uh, next is sudden cardiac death. So reported in the literature as about 0.5 to 1% risk. However, this is likely overestimated given most cases of HCM, as we discussed, are undiagnosed and they're walking around without any problems. Uh, and so try and identify people at risk and uh, prevent this from happening. So what are the clinical risk factors for SCD? So um, this is from the 2020 AHA guidelines. So uh, first is the family history of sudden cardiac death from uh, Hocum. Um, and they uh, attribute, like they said, this is a sudden death that is judged to be secondary to HCM in one or more first degree relatives who are uh, age 50 or less. Uh, massive LVH, so wall thicknesses above uh, 30 millimeters in any segment, uh, increase the risk of sudden cardiac death. Unexplained syncope in the patient himself. HCM with LV systolic dysfunction, as we mentioned before, a burnt out HCM with an EF less than 50%. Uh, LV apical aneurysm, so independent of size, increase the risk of sudden cardiac death. Extensive uh, late gadolinium enhancement on cardiac MRI especially if it's comprising more than 15% of the LV mass. And finally, non-sustained VT on uh, monitoring carries more weight if the runs are frequent, more than three uh, longer, if it's more than 10 beats, or if it's uh, faster than 200 beats per minute in the uh, usually mo usual monitoring monitored setting of 24 to 48 hours. So since this is an echo talk, I'll focus on massive LVH, HCM with LV stock dysfunction, and LV apical aneurysms, since these are factors we can see on uh, echo. So first is LVH. So the number they the cutoff they use is 30 millimeters, which uh, significantly increases your risk of sudden death. What's important to note, though, this 30 millimeters isn't a magic number where your uh, risk suddenly goes up. It's a gradual increase. So any as uh, the more hy uh, hypertrophy you have, the higher the risk of sudden cardiac death. <laughs> Uh, what's important, uh, since this is a very important uh, diameter, we want to make sure we're measuring it right. So you want to be perpendicular uh, to the uh, wall of the septum, uh, and we want to make sure we're not including any of the RV structures as demonstrated on the uh, picture on the left here. Uh, and then we want to make sure we're cutting the septum uh, perpendicularly to get the accurate assessment and not a tangential cut, which can cause a uh, um, give us a, like a different assessment and make it look bigger than it actually is. I kind of equate this to like cutting a cucumber. If you're like cutting perpendicular, you get the actual diameter of the cucumber. But if you're cutting diagonal on the right side, you can see how it looks bigger than it is. Um, LVF less than 50%. So this is a, a recent factor that's been added in the 2020 uh, HA guidelines. It wasn't present in the 2011 guidelines. So uh, there's a study done by Rowan et al. Uh, looking at 118 patients with uh, end stage or burnt out HCM with LVF less than 50%. He kind of uh, divided them into uh, minimal symptoms, NYHA 1 to 2, and more symptoms, NYHA 3 to 4, and followed them for uh, about 10 years. Uh, so you see in the less symptomatic group, there was 100% survival, and the more symptomatic group, there's 33% deaths, 67% survived. But uh, as you can see, regardless of which group you're in, there's been significant uh, ICD interventions for VTVF. So regardless of symptoms, just the fact that your ejection fraction is lower than 50%, you have an increased risk of ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, LV apical aneurysms, this is also a, uh, a new... Uh, Addition in the 2020 guidelines wasn't present in the 2011 guidelines. Rowan et al. looked about almost 2,000 patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. About 5% had apical aneurysms. Um, and as you can see, the risk of H on the left, HCM-related adverse events is much higher in patients with apical aneurysms. 
and that includes the arrhythmic events. And they have a, they have a low rate of survival on the Kaplan-Meier curve on the right. Uh, as we mentioned before, it's very important to use uh, echo contrast to assess uh, the apex. As you can see on the first panel there on the left, you, you couldn't even tell the patient has an LV apical aneurysm. But when using contrast, you can clearly see it. And uh, obviously on cardiac MRI, you would also see it more clearly. Uh, the European Society of Cardiology has this nice calculator where it can give you the uh, five-year risk of sudden cardiac death. So you have to put in the patient's age, maximum LV wall thickness, lift atrial size, max LVOT gradient, family history of sudden cardiac death, non-sustained VT, and unexplained syncope. Uh, this calculator was made before the newest 2020 guidelines, so it doesn't in include the LV apical aneurysm and uh, LV ejection fraction. Uh, and finally, the last part of the talk that I wanted to focus on is uh, conditions that could mimic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So uh, number one, I guess the most common thing would be uh, conditions that cause pressure overload, usually hypertension, but aortic stenosis can cause it as well. Uh, factors that can help differentiate is uh, in uh, pressure overload conditions, you mostly have a concentric rather than asymmetric uh, hypertrophy. And then it's rare for pressure overload to produce a wall thickness in excess of 18 to 19. As we mentioned in HCM, the cutoff for the diagnosis is 15, but most patients have upwards of uh, 20 millimeters of uh, LV wall thickness. It's just a loop for a patient with severe concentric hypertrophy due to hypertension. As you can see, the LV is uh, symmetrically involved in uh, all the walls. Uh, athlete's heart is an important mimicker as well. Uh, professional athletes frequently develop physiological hypertrophy, hypertrophy just from the stress of their exercise, uh, which can mimic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is important to uh, recognize because HCM is the most common cause of sudden death among athletes. And in patients with uh, severe HCM, we ask them to uh, uh, not be involved in competitive exercise due to the increased risk of death. So two important distinctions um, uh, are the degree of LV hypertrophy and chamber dilation. I can go into it here. Uh, so we kind of have a gray zone with the LV wall thickness uh, 13 to 15, but less than that is more with athlete's heart. More than that is more hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, unusual patterns, asymmetries, more suggestive of LV hypertrophy. The cavity size can be an important clue if it's this athlete heart versus HCM. As an HCM, we explained previously, the uh, LV hypertrophy is at the expense of the LV cavity size, so they have smaller LV cavities. Well, in athlete's heart, they actually have dilation of the ventricle uh, to, uh, to get more blood flow. They have higher stroke volume, so that's an important uh, difference between the two. Uh, left atrial enlargement can be seen in, in both. Bizarre ECG patterns, again, can be seen in both. Abnormal LV filling, female gender, that's more, more in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, if you have decrease in thickness with deconditioning and stopping sports, that argues for athlete's heart. Family history of ACM obviously is uh, uh, um, more consistent with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And uh, finally, VOT max of more than 110% uh, indicating the patient is very fit uh, argues for athlete's heart. Uh, finally, we have some rare conditions that can mimic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy such as cardiac amyloidosis, glycogen storage diseases, Fabry's disease, Friedrich's ataxia. These all can mimic it as they all have LV hypertrophy. However, they usually have other systemic manifestations that kind of clue us into the diagnosis. Uh, this is just a loop for a patient with uh, cardiac amyloid. As you can see, it's usually concentric LVH. Uh, these are described as having a speckling pattern, but uh, as you can see, the RV is also usually involved in uh, uh, cardiac amyloid, as well as uh, you have biatrial enlargement uh, as well. I believe that was, yeah, that was my last slide. Finished a little bit earlier than expected. Well, thank, thank you for this very comprehensive review of um, the thickened heart and uh, hypertrophic and mouth is being a very common topic in the uh, Royal College exam that many of our colleagues are actually preparing and will be preparing uh, shortly. I think you know it calls for the one of the next rounds about you know in general 
differential diagnosis of thickened heart. And uh, as you mentioned, you touched upon the amyloidosis, Fabry disease. These are becoming very big uh, in the uh, local, international, and uh, national meetings because, um, you know, the, the new uh, therapy, um, they're very expensive. And the drug companies are very much into this, to um, into a rare disease finding. So, um, I mean, I've been involved in a number of discussion about using artificial intelligence and going through databases as well as uh, imaging databases to look for these cases. So rare, rare disease finding, because ma many of which are underdiagnosed, as you mentioned in one of the slides, about 80 to 90 percent. Also, like you mentioned a number of things about the drag process versus venturi. Uh, as many of my colleagues know, you know, um, U of T is a big sites uh, uh, for, for whichever kind of market for many years. Uh, I, I train from McGill, so all I hear about HCM is all the work that was done from U of T. So, um, but, and when I come here, you know, obviously there's big hypertrophic kind of market clinics that's run from uh, UHN and it's been helping lots of patients with very targeted therapy in terms of the um, cytomyectomy and uh, the uh, uh, contrast uh, directed um, um, alcohol ablation. So those are the things that you know we're able to offer our patients uh, within the GTA and, and also Ontario as well. So the other thing that was very big in the development over the last 20 years was uh, the contrast because um, it, prior to contrast, it's uh, uh, many of these cases are missed. Uh, in particular, our echo machines, the near field is actually much more difficult because um, and you know harmonics also help as well in terms of. Uh, identify the near field uh, situation because of apical hypertrophic neuropathy. So there was a plethora of cases. There was about 10 or 15 years ago when we started having contrast and also harmonic imaging that we are able to actually start picking out these patients with very abnormal ECG finding. And another point about the um, abnormal ECG finding, we also get to know about um, another set of patients who have apically displaced pap muscle, which which really Sort of like a mimicker of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that has very similar abnormal ECGs, uh, but in fact they they don't have HCM but they have apically displaced pap muscle. Originally published from the uh, Korean groups. Um, okay, so with, with my sort of like quick summary on my side. So let's see if any of my colleagues have any comments, um, uh, including uh, Dr. Leon Poi and also Dr. Bob Howard. And by the way, we have about 31 people signed in at this moment. So it's, a, it's actually very good for, for in between week. Aziz, that was a, that was a great talk. Um, could you co comment a bit on the challenge of um, uh, uh, differentiating or assessing LVOT obstruction in the presence of valvular aortic stenosis? Yeah, so that's always challenging as uh, like given the uh, uh, the continuous wave Doppler kind of gives us a mix, maximum velocity but doesn't tell us where it is. We kind of use the pulse wave Doppler to kind of try and assess where the, uh, the obstruction is. But again, it's difficult to tell if you have like a, a thickened aortic valve with uh, suggestions of aortic stenosis. It's very difficult to tell uh, where the obstruction actually is. Uh, some of the clues can be the dagger-shaped uh, Doppler of uh, HCM versus the parabolic shape of aortic stenosis. Um, and also the timing, uh, you get like mid-systole uh, initiation of the Doppler wave in uh, HCM. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, the, I think the, the point's well made in terms of difficulty differentiating. And, and because that's also difficult to uh, assess the severity of the aortic stenosis. Um, you know, with the LVOT obstruction, the the LVOT VTI is is generally quite high, even beyond the obstruction, and you lead to an overestimation of the stroke volume. So you get you know stroke volumes of like 150 milliliters in a small hypertrophied left ventricle, which is which is not really possible. Um, mm. So we end up trying not to necessarily report aortic valve area calculated. Uh, in that setting because it tends to overestimate valve area. I see. Yep, and it's one of the more confusing um, sort of situations and, and often in actually in the echo exam, if you, if you take the Ameri uh, American Board of Echo exam, this question comes up. It was in mine actually. 
uh, when I took it many, many, many years ago. One, one thing I'm curious about whether whether uh, Tom or, or, or Bob can comment on how how this like hypertrophic kind of myopathy focus developed at U of T. This is something that I actually never knew because that was before I joined the uh, the U of T um, uh, faculty. So I'm actually curious so, how this all started. So Chiming, uh, uh, in large part, it was driven by uh, Dr. Doug Weigel at uh, at uh, TGH. So he actually had an interest in it early, made some of the earliest diagnoses, and was an author on some of the earliest papers even describing the clinical condition. It's interesting, the whole question of drag versus venturi, somehow that became a big deal in cardiology in the 60s, and Doug Weigel used to talk about a major debate at the AHA, you know, in which he was pushing the venturi effect and somebody else was pushing the drag effect, and, you know, at times, it sounded like it was actually going to come to, you know, to blows over that. So it's interesting to hear it described now as probably a combination, which is probably the right answer. But uh, really, Doug Weigel drove it and then developed the the program at, at TPH, which grew. And Harry Rakowski, uh, who you know well, actually uh, developed it further after Doug. Um, and uh, and now it's like you know um, the 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 um, the people who follows uh, uh, like Anna Wu and many other people are still carrying the torch and keep keep that going. It, sometimes I just find it hard to refer patients to them because um, of the referral process and you know my patients don't hear from them. But ho hopefully, if they improve the process, then we can benefit even more um, as they add more new people to. It. So the I'm from the Boston group Tom, at some it's, point. It's, yeah. Hi, Bob. Go ahead. Oh, it's just uh, I, was, I was around back in the day when uh, some of these fights went on with uh, between a, there was a guy in the States called Michael, Michael Criley, who was a oh, yeah. the Doug Wagle. Literally, they would almost come to blows at the uh, American meetings. And uh, they were actually some of the most uh, that uh, you couldn't get into the room. There were so many people that wanted to go because and hear the, the two of them talk because it was so entertaining. They they literally uh, they they didn't like each other very well and didn't hold back in those days. It was uh, um, but the fight, Tom, I think was the notion of obstruction versus catheter entrapment uh, in the LV. So Criley's view was that there was no obstruction. It was just these ventricles. Uh, you know, collapse on themselves. So when you put a catheter in the RLV to measure the LV pressure, it would be high uh, due to that. And uh, Weigel's view was that this was um, uh, outflow tract obstruction. Uh, and echo was actually pretty important in sort of demonstrating SAM, which uh, before echo, they really were looking at these cases just with catheters. And there was a whole thing about end hole versus side hole catheters and so forth. So echo actually had a lot to do, I think, with, with convincing most people that there was outflow tract obstruction rather than just uh, uh, cavity obliteration in systole. And then the whole drag thing is, you know, I think came next, Tom. Um, yeah. So it, those were interesting days. Yep. Different different attitudes about how to present at a meeting than there are today. We're much more civilized today than <laughs> in those days. Yeah, I remember some of these uh, discussions. I came into the field at, at towards the tail end of it. I'm I'm with the Boston group, so the Boston group was very much into uh, the push versus then the pull. So we, like you know they they were actually in the cam of the of the drag or, or the push uh, rather than actually the venturi effect. So that, that was, and then there was a whole discussion at some point about the use of uh, disopyramide versus like guaraphamil and all this type of thing. So um, certainly this field is actually very colorful in terms of um, discussion and all the major leaders around around um, um, around to actually t uh, be involved in this. Okay, any other comments? Just maybe a, just a little more discussion about the valve. You know, I think in the early days, it was the thought was this was septal hypertrophy. It was a hypertrophy muscle disarray problem. But you know, there's more and more looking at the valve. The mitral valve itself is abnormal. Um, you know, abnormally long and and the sort of 
combination of things. And, uh, you know, how often is this a septal hypertrophy with a normal mitral valve versus, um, you know, an abnormal mitral valve that's very elongated and, and therefore more prone to uh, LVO to uh, obstruction without necessarily so much hypertrophy and, and how that, how that, how that, what the thinking about that is these days. So that was also the Boston group I was with uh, Bob Levine. And at the time it was a uh, Pravin Shah and him. They, they had a lot of like, you know, um, uh, um, sort of like their contribution to talk about the measurement of the length of the mitral leaflet among patients with hypertrophic neuropathy, especially asymmetric ones versus the other ones that the mitral leaflet is actually longer. So that sort of like, you know, it's like a bigger sail so that they can caught in the wind, so as to say. So that those are some of the description or discussion that happened uh, about 20 years ago about this pushing force that the sail got trapped in the wind, so as to say. No, longer mitral leaflet. Actually, one of, one of the observations related to that, and it was a great presentation and the, the discussion around the mitral leaflets is important because in particular, uh, elongation of the posterior leaflet, sometimes you can severe, see severe obstruction, but no MR, because the mitral leaflet elongation actually prevents the MR from occurring. So, it, you know, if you don't see MR, then you should be thinking about abnormal mitral leaflets in the set of setting of severe LVOT obstruction and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And, to, and Tom, how does all of this relate to genetic, you know, testing, genetic testing? and who gets you tested? Know, who doesn't? And you no, know, essentially, I think I think everyone who has a clinical diagnosis of HCM should be offered genetic testing. Not all choose to go through that, uh, in large part because there is some conflicting information on prognostic value from some of the genetic abnormalities. Uh, but mostly, it's also really important in terms of following um, uh, family members. Uh, just as an anecdote, I saw a 50-year-old patient in clinic on Monday whose father I follow with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with severe obstruction and an ICD, and uh, she has no echo evidence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but has the same myosin heavy chain genetic abnormality. So, uh, it, it, so there isn't a direct link between the genetics and the phenotype necessarily. Um, but going back to the underlying cause, the fact that it's a lot of sarcomeric proteins, it actually may be dysfunctional sarcomeres that contribute to the hypertrophy as opposed to being some increased contractility, which was the original thinking. And how many of these people, Tom, should have uh, late gadolinium uh, scanning looking for fibrosis? Uh, you know, I, I think there are centers that do it routinely, that'll do MRs routinely as part of prognosis. Um, I, I think uh, in Toronto, there is a tendency to, to order it in patients who have, you know, clear hypertrophy as part of a screening uh, risk assessment, um, similar to what I've talked about. So I tend to do MRIs for, for uh, screening purposes way more commonly today because of that, just to have a baseline on their gadolinium enhancement. Um, the, other, the other thing about apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the importance of the apical aneurysm is true, but even in the absence of apical aneurysm, it's probably worth screening for apical ischemia, including silent ischemia. So um, uh, it is one of the reasons to do uh, nuclear testing on apical hypertrophs to see if there is silent apical ischemia, which may predict risk of future aneurysm formation. And, and what will you do differently? Do you find out uh, if the ischemia, um, uh, there is significant ischemia in the apex of apical HCM? Yeah, it, it, may, it may actually um, uh, promote the use of beta blockers earlier, even in asymptomatic people, you know, because there's no clear evidence that beta blockers are protective in the apicals or asymptomatic, uh, but you may choose to do it in that case. Uh, it really does provide prognostic in, uh, information. Uh, Anna Wu published a paper probably a decade or so ago showing that that ischemia was predictive of worse outcomes in apicals. Great. 
and what what about ICDs in those patients? I usually refer them to Paul Dorian for an assessment. It's um, I, I again, I think the the risk factors for sudden death that were that were pointed out. It's worth doing that risk assessment and then deciding, you know, whether or not uh, prophylactic ICD is warranted. There's a lot of variability of its use in the in the literature. You know, there are there are individuals who promote it for anyone with more than 30 millimeters of myocardial thickness. I think it's an overall risk assessment and a discussion with the patient. So Abdul Aziz, you mentioned about this uh, calculator that uh, the ESC came out. So like, you know, what, what was the cutoff that you would use in, in terms of different action? Like if it's 5% versus like one versus 10, like how, how would you do it differently with that calculator? On sudden death. Yeah, I think if somebody had, you know, if if the average sudden death risk is 1%, I think if the risk is above 5%, I usually have them assessed by our EP team. Um, often the decision is to, to follow and to monitor as opposed to ICD implantation. Um, so actually, Jimmy, I, I, I don't know if there's a set cutoff. I don't know the answer to that. Well, it's nice to have these calculators. And then the obvious next question is like, what do you do with a number? So that, that's when we, whenever we cut, create these like uh, online tools and then it's like, so what? So, so that's why we always have to have some kind of like, you know, know what to do next. But it's good to know there's a calculator. Great. So that, that was a very, very good discussion. So, so now all the residents and fellows know once you started the topic, you can get uh, uh, colleagues to actually like add a lot more information to it. So any other comments finally? And Otherwise, we'll uh, wait for another and exciting episode next week when everybody's sort of back to more of the September mode, the kids back to school, all this type of thing. Okay, once again, thank you, Abdul Aziz, for presenting such a, a thought-provoking topic, a very colorful one, especially in the context of U of T. Thank you all for listening. Okay, we'll sign off. Bye. See you next week.